We're here at the Wetsuit Outlet and Zyk International Moth World Championships with some of the elder statesmen of the international moth class who've sailed them for a number of years. And we've got Jason Belbin, Mike Lennon, Ricky Tagg, Simon Payne, Les Thorpe and Hiroki Goto. And you, we've got three sailors here who have been sailing since the low-riding days, Jason, Simon and Les. Um, let's start with Les. What was it like, those initial days, when you were switching over to foiling from low-riding? Well, one word, it was wild. I mean, we were converting boats. So we had existing boats that were set up for low-riding and basically chucking foils on them. No one knew what angle they were. No one knew what we were doing. Control was just a little bit more than zero and off you went. We had the, you just raged your way around the course and just had a good time, but it was intense. And um, Jason, um, I remember back when I was young, I used to read about the Blitz and the Blitz Mark III and these ridiculously thin water lines that you had on them. And then suddenly just changing style. How did you find that? I uh, changed your style to the foiling moths. Yeah, um, to the foiling. Yeah, it was a, it was a, a gradual change actually because I had a prowler and uh, which was a low rider that converted. Um, so I have actually found sailing the foiling easier <laughs> than sailing the very narrow width um, low riders we had. And Simon, um, you were in the low riders for a while but then took a break and came back into the foilers and were very successful. And so did you miss this initial stage of the foiling boats? No. Okay. No, n not really. I think the boats have got better, more accessible, easier to sail and more rewarding over the years. Low riders are far harder work than, than foilers. I think we probably all agree on that. I think you can sail a foiler into, uh, to a later age. Uh, where, where low, rider, low riders were, um, you know, they're quite painful. You know, you spend a lot of time on your knees and um, being able to spread out in a foiling boat is uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a nicer thing to do. Okay. And Hiroki, um, with, with the moth class, it has become a huge international class now. And do you think foiling actually benefited the class and yeah. the popularity worldwide? I do think so. I actually I started selling right after the very early stage of foiling. So I don't really know about roll riding, but I heard there's a, a hard argument that the most society will accept the foiling or not. And there was a hard argument and in the end the foiling was accepted to the class and now if we didn't accept, I don't think the most class survive. I think it's true. Yep. Now, Ricky, you've sailed many, many classes before the international moths. What was it that initially attracted you in? Um, it was so different and just so stupid. And as Les said, you had control systems that basically were ornaments rather than functional. <laughs> and it was just an inordinate quack. You just got on the boat and you sent it, and if you were, had a good day, you'd come back in one piece. Bits used to blow off with monotonous regularity, whereas now they're, they're built so strongly and they can stand so much abuse. But before, it was like bits from model aircraft holding cut control rods together it's just ridiculous now mike you have been at the forefront of development both in sales and also in the hulls and so you've seen it all through the time and if there's one person who's going to be modifying their boat the entire time it is you and um, so with that how have you found the developments through the years initially i came in uh, the sort of crossover between the old, the, the original foilers, which were things like prowlers that Simon had when I came into the class, I, I came straight into a blade rider that was purpose built for foiling. But back then, they had very little uh, changeability. You, you, you fixed everything before you went, and you know, we were foiling about six inches clear of the water before we realized um, 
it was adv advantageous to sail a lot higher uh, and get rid of the wetted area. But so, I mean, this first, one of the first things I did was put an adjustable wand on the boat. That just made it safer because the differential in speed between upwind and downwind and so on meant, meant you were falling higher downwind than you were upwind just because of the speed difference. There was no way of stopping that back then. So it's just, you know, starting to do things like that from the, from the beginning just to make it easier. It was, it was all about making it easier back then, not faster. Just make it easier because they crashed a lot. OK, Les, let's fast forward to 2023 now. And at the moment, the class is going through another stage where it's looking at the different things that are getting developed and going, is this too far? But one of the useful things about being involved in the class for a long time means you've seen points where there have been stresses before. What's your view, for example, on the titanium foils, for example? Oh, look, we'll get to the titanium foils. I think that every AGM has almost the same argument about reducing costs because it's going to... And people turn up to the AGM and talk about it's going to kill the class, kill the class. It's like we had 150 entries here and it was sold out in two hours. Like the, the class is well and truly alive. It's, it's fine. Um, it's been the same for 30 years, the same argument. It's just whether it's how many sales can you have, how many masks can you have, how many falls can you have. It's the same argument every single time. And traditionally the class is always almost self-regulated because if you go out and have the wrong choice of sale, mask, foil, whatever it be at the time, and you choose the wrong one, well, you will have a ruined day. And it's, if you've got four races back to back, you choose the wrong one, well, you're done. And it self-regulates. So everyone tries to create a rig or a foil or anything that can cover a big range. And that's what I think we're at. The Titanium Falls is, it's, it's, it might be so, it depends whether it's a massive advantage for a massive cost, then that could hurt us. But traditionally, you know, things like that had been small gains that people have gone, well, I can still make it up some other way. But it's, time will tell. But I'm, I'm anti the two equipment rule. I'm anti any restriction like that. But people that sit around here for four days have heard enough of that from me, right? So I'm not going to say much more. And Simon, um, you've been out of the class for a little while, but as a two-time world champion, you know the kind of dedication it takes to win in a class like this. When you see the boats, though, now, and the speeds that they're achieving, does it ever tempt you to come back? Uh, you know, I'm more interested in a titanium hip than I am a <laughs> titanium foil uh, these days. Uh, when I come to events like this, I... Uh, realised I missed the people I used to race against. Um, I'm delighted still to be the youngest of the guys on the sofa. Um, whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, just... But uh, I, I, I don't miss a sailing. Uh, I'm in awe of the boat, and I think it's fantastic. My friends on these sofas, on on this sofa, are, you know, are still going, still enjoying it. Um, for me, it finished a while back. The boats are clearly different. They're going faster. Are they, are they better? Um, yes, they're certainly more expensive. Should they still foil in the same winds that the Prowlers and the Blade Riders and the Mac 2s used to foil at? Definitely. Yeah, we're, we're sitting here and there's a breeze out there. Um, I, I would suggest that early foilers would have sailed around that okay. Mm. Well, maybe. It's lighter than it looks. Now, Ricky, that's an interesting one. You've got guidelines where 50% of the fleet should be foiling or it should be at least six knots. And this seems to have resulted in this situation where you're almost chasing your tail, where people are just going smaller and smaller foils because they know that they're faster when the breeze is up, but you end up with a higher point in the wind range where you can start racing. What's your view on that? It is a difficult one, um, and you've nailed it. I think the easiest, if we want to maximise the wind windows that we have, we do need to look at the guidelines and go, as they used to be way back when, which was six knots, full stop. And we are a class that foils, but we're also, we can low ride, and it wouldn't be the first time we've had low riding 
finishes to races at world championships. I get all the froth about foiling. However, six knots and then fine, you can have two bits of kit. You just got all one piece of kit and you've got to make it figure out how do you cover six knots to 20 knots. And that's as much as there's that requires design and sailor skill. Now, Les, I can see you're itching to add to it. Add oh, to me that. to this one. I, I can see, I exactly agree with what you're saying. It's all been, it's always been getting kit that covers the full range. And I hate the 50% falling rule. Because if that's the case, I'm going to go out there with the smallest falls there are and encourage all my mates to do the same thing. And before we know it, will be a one trick pony that only sails in 15, 18 knots. And that is, that is, that is what will kill the class, not, not cost. That's what will kill, kill the class. So I always say if the race committee can set a course because there's enough true wind, we should be sailing, whether we're falling or not, right? And there's some – so I think Simon's not sailing probably because he's on the smaller side, right? And basically the class has got a lot bigger people in it, which has opened it up to more people. But the smaller guys are not as competitive, but maybe they are on that light day. And so who's saying that someone can't come here and set themselves for light wins and win the world? It's good luck to them. Jason, you got anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I, I totally agree with Ricky, to be honest. I think we should be um, six knot win range. Um, it, I, I disagree with Simon. I think we actually can foil in, in almost lighter conditions than we used to in the old days. Yeah. It's just putting the right foil on, to be honest. So in this little forum here, almost complete agreement that this 50% rule should be scrapped? Yeah. You know, yeah. everyone just gets smaller and smaller, so the wind... You have to go higher and higher on the... Uh, um, on, on the to get 50% of the fleet feel, sailing when we've all got tiny foils on. We, you know, if, if we carry on, people have turned up here with foils about the size of rudders. We're going to be in 18 knots yeah. before we're all foiling, which is ridiculous. We should be sailing, we should have been sailing today. There's, there's no reason late why in the late afternoon today we couldn't have got some foiling. If we were in the old Exocets or Mac 2s from, from sort of 10 years ago, we'd have been ripping around with the big rigs and big foils. This may be a delicate question, but which one of this group is actually the oldest sailor? And how long do you think you can carry on sailing an international moth competitively? Oh, you know, I'm hoping. There you go, We're the same age, by the way. Then it's me. Okay. Um. You can sail them for many, many years. Whether you can sail them competitively, I don't know. I think it's how good your drug regime is, I think, after a period of time. There's an awful lot of Voltarol and, th and analgesics needed after a big day. And... One of the great things we're seeing um, is we've got some really great young sailors, especially the Kiwis who've come over. Hiroki, what do you think of the younger generation of foilers who are coming through and sailing the boat so well? Yeah. The, in the boat park, I found uh, the, the boy next to me is 15 years old. <laughs> He's younger than my son. <laughs> Oh, amazing feeling, yeah. That I, I, it, it, it makes me feel that I'm that, that old yeah, comp compared to him. But I'm really happy to see him l l like him, and we admire those ages to come into the class. That's great. Yeah. I was um, so young Jack today from New Zealand. He's it's his 18th birthday. Happy birthday, Jack! Happy right. Birthday. He was, you know looking at my boat and goes, look at all the deck grip. He's going, oh, this is old man stuff, right? I said, mate, <laughs> in 32 years' time, I'll come to the Moth Regatta and I'll ask you how many soft bits you have on your boat. He goes, are you 32 years older than me? I'm like, sorry, mate. Yeah, I am. Right. I, I guess, Simon, um, looking at the international Moth class, from the outside, a lot of people will just go, oh, you've got to be insanely fit. You've got to be a certain age bracket. But what other high-performance class is there? where you can have such a wide range, age range sailing the class. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I personally think you should, anyone under 30 should be banned, really. <laughs> and I'm sure everyone is 
this so this sofa agrees but um look i you know the, the, i've been in the class i won my first europeans in 94 95 something like that um and i've been associated all, uh, with it all, all the way up until i stopped in 2012 maybe so a long uh, so I've, I've missed a lot of the latter stuff but what i what i can say is for me the moth class was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me um it gave me it gave me focus I, 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 many of my friends um came from the sailing i did in my own small way it got me feeling good about results i'd achieved uh, and so, yes, it is about flying around super quick, but we mustn't lose what, what the class is. It's a big group of friends who have one thing in common. And the energy uh, that we all get from each other and the, the, the friends that these youngsters from New Zealand will make, th which, that we say will carry through their sailing life, is to me as important as, as, as y the boats, which will always evolve. And in five years, we'll be sitting back and looking at those things out there with their black sails and thinking, yeah, I, do you remember those? Uh, so so, so that, that is the really important thing. It, it is the, the adventure. And if life's about having adventure, you know, on the water in a moth, it, 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 with this crowd, it, it, it doesn't get much better. I've got one last question for all of you. And I'd like to start from Jason and work round. We know there are so many people sitting on the fence and as to whether they should get into the moth class, knowing it's a bit of a commitment to get started in the class. Each of you, just 15, 20 seconds on why they should join the moth class. Uh, I think uh, this point in time is an ideal opportunity because there's so many good boats out there for sale, second hand, that are possibly cheaper than other foiling boats. Um, then it'll come down here and you, you'll see the moth mark exchange thing and you pick yourself up a bargain. Mike? Um, before the moths, so I've been in the moths now for 15, 16 years. Before that, my longest in any other class was about five years. So I used to enjoy going from class to class to class. But once you've got into the moth, you kind of don't know where to go after that. You know, it's, everything else seems like a step backwards. <laughs> so it, it's kind of once you're in, you can't, I think you're in for life. Ricky? <laughs> um... I had actually stopped racing and sailing boats. I got bored and I was persuaded by a friend to come and sail his, what I now know to be a death trap. Um, he came to lunch and I went down and met him and went out. I came home and I walked in the door and she went, ooh. I said, that was awesome. She said, good, go and buy one and go sailing. Simon. Look, I think the moth is unique in that it's, it's a boat which is just fun and it's not always necessary to race it. You know, so many dinghy classes you have to race to enjoy. Where a moth, for me, was always as much fun belting around Chichester Harbour as it was competing at an event. Uh, I think that's unique, you know, uh, just that dinghy free ride flying around at 20 knots on a nautical motorcycle. It doesn't get much better. It really doesn't. Les? Totally agree with all those comments. I guess that was what I was going to say, but I guess my next one was to those one design people out there with got a boat that you can't change. Well, you can change a moth as much as you want. You can just walk around the boat park and copy something. And that's why we have such a range of age and size in the class, because you can adapt it to what's best for you. Hiroki. Yeah, I still remember when I get into the first moth national in Japan, and I, I told them that I get to the final destination of dinghy sailing. And I want to say to, to the youth guy that younger ages that if you want to taste the, the pinnacle of sailing, it's a moth. Well, thank you all for your time. It's been fascinating to hear all your views on the moth class and where it's come from and where it's going. So great to speak to you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks,